Welcome back, everybody. My name is Michael Metz, and I am honored to have with me the jazz trumpet legend, Mr. Bobby Shu, joining me for an interview. Welcome, Bobby. It's an honor to have you here. Thanks, Mike. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that before we recorded, uh, before Thanks, we started Mike. the recording button. <laughs> Five decades ago, I remember you. <laughs> I, I think you were 12 years old when I met you or something like that. Yeah, I was I was four years behind my brother. So I was probably about 12 and 13 when we worked together up at Hummingbird, huh? Yeah, right. Yeah. So so you're from Albuquerque, which is is absolutely amazing that what you've been able to do and, and, and you've remembered your roots. What high school did you attend and what year did you graduate, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I went to Valley High School right after the open. The second year it was open. And uh, I went to, prior to that, I had, I graduated in 1959 from Valley. Uh, what my history, educational history in Albuquerque is interesting because my mom put me in St. Teresa's Catholic School. For, oh, goodness. <laughs> for four years and I spent, I spent all of my first four years on my knees trying to figure out what a Holy Ghost was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, but it was a it was a bit brutal. Catholic school was a bit brutal. There was no music for nothing, you know, other than praying and kneeling and stuff, you know. But um, I finally got a chance to move to La Luz Elementary when I was ten in the fifth grade, and ironically, um, about two years before that, or a year and a half before that, my uh, second stepfather, where I got the name Shu, uh, had he had played trumpet for a couple of years in elementary school and so forth and his band director was Lloyd Higgins if you remember Lloyd oh my goodness I do yes and so uh, but anyway they were doing a, a spring cleaning and they got out cleaned the closet out and this trumpet came out of the closet so my stepfather pulled that thing out and tried to play it you know and it was the most god-awful horrible sounding thing <laughs> but, but he tried to play America on it you know and it was like God save the queen kind of thing you know and but, you know, I'd never seen a trumpet, so I'm going, what is that, you know? But anyway, he, he loaned it to me, and the first day in uh, at La Luz Elementary, a lady comes around. Uh, her name was Joyce Johnson. She was a string player, violin or viola or something. She was a band director for a bunch of elementary schools and junior highs and stuff around. <clears throat> and she came in to, and interrupted my class, and, and she said, any of you kids like to join the band? And I went, Join the band, you know, my hand, next thing I know my hand's up in the air, you know. So I always kind of had a, a not a, a understandably linked with music, but my grandmother and my mom and a couple of her sisters, and I was raised in my grandmother's house. They used to play a lot of classical music, you know, Mario Lanza, the great Caruso, uh, some things like that, but they played uh, Wayne King and Guy Lombardo a lot. Okay. I heard, I heard a lot of music, and they used to there used to be a show called the bell telephone hour that was on uh i think every sunday evening and okay. my, uncle, my uncle tom uh who was a he loved classical music and they used to put on that that radio show every night and i'd be there laying on a blanket and a diaper you know but i'm listening to the, the new york philharmonic every sunday you know and and i think there was a lot of music just being absorbed in an auditory way you know with me but anyway i got into the the uh the, in the band at the age of 10 and and got a book and my stepfather sat with me and showed me to do a couple of things and I could play the trumpet immediately. He showed me how to read. I went the first day to beginning band uh, at La Luz and uh, there were seven kids in the school. I remember a bunch of them. My Luther Martinez was a baritone horn player and Connie Claus was a clarinet player. Uh, but anyway, uh, I went in there and uh, Oh, the teacher said, oh, did you get the horn? Did you get the book? And I said, yeah, I got it. But I said, I got the book, but I'm so sorry I didn't play get to play all the tunes last night because they sent me to bed, you know? <laughs> wait, wait, you played through the whole book? I played through about half of the book the first night when they sent me to bed. And, and then she opened the book to the back and she said, did you play this one last night? And I said, no. So she said, can you play it? I played it perfectly. And she said, go back to class. You're not going to be in the beginning band. I thought I'd screwed up already, you know. Geez, I, I've had the horn like 15 minutes in my hand and I'm already in trouble, you know. 
But what happened, she sent me to, to Stronghurst Junior High School for the advanced band on Saturday morning. This all happened on a Thursday, it was the first day. Saturday, I went down there and I auditioned. I got second chair in the advanced band my first day. But I had a natural, I had a very natural thing. I was always like, I wasn't the dumbest kid in the class. You know, so when my stepfather showed me how to read, I was always pretty good with math, subdivision, mm -hmm. four, half, you know, whole notes, half notes, quarters, eighth notes, and and the fingerings to the C scale and the C chromatic scale. Mm -hmm. And I remembered them and I could play. And there's, I, you know, I've told the story a lot of times in lessons because he showed me something about opening up and allowing the air to work for me that that made it so easy to play. It was just, I thought, why is everybody having trouble? This thing is a piece of cake to play, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you see, there are people who, you know, they shut everything down here and it's just a matter of keeping everything open. Well, I know how, I know, I know all about that. I'm in my 60s. <laughs> My, I've been teaching for 66 years, not solid. Because yeah, but still. But, you know, I gave my first lesson when I was 14 to a nine-year-old kid over on Griegos Road. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't, I never had any lessons myself, but it was just so natural for me to play the horn. It was just, I've, you know, I've been playing now almost 71 years. I've looked back and, you know, I tell that story, I think, well, how did I do that? You know, but it's, it was just, it was a combination of all of the right elements. And I wasn't, you know, I had a very easy time with visual things and math and subdivisions. And I had a good memory and, and plus I had, uh, I realized I didn't realize a lot of these things and for maybe until after I'd been playing for a lot of years, you know, but uh, I had a natural sense of rhythm inside I could feel rhythm I didn't have to count stuff on my fingers and and the other thing that I had which was very easy for me was I had a really good inner ear because you could you could play ba ba do ba 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 and I could well, I could push any valve down and play it on starting on any key you know kind of you know and I learned by to play by ear really easily so I was I learned to improvise at 12 years old wow and uh playing little wedding gigs and at 12, 13, 14 years old. By the time I got into high school, I was working at the Sunset Inn, you know, with, the, with Frank Shuiwi and all kinds of people like that, Bill Shar and all these guys. I was busy. I had a steady gig at, at, nine, at 14 years old or 15, you know, but that's the way I grew up. Never had any lessons, you know. So, so, so uh, you, you finished high school in 59 and then in 1960, you were drafted by the army and you played in the NATO US, what is it, the the uh, armed force, oh, NORAD, NORAD Joint Forces Band for three years, right? Yeah. What was what was that yeah, like? I mean, so what was, yeah, what was well, that was like? Because, well, I'll tell you how it all happened. I got called for the draft. It was 1961 and I went to UNM kind of briefly, uh, but, um, I got called in and for, for the draft and I thought, oh no, I really don't feel like going to some foreign country and shooting kids, you know? So uh, I was into a, went into a music store and there was a saxophone player. You might remember Ben Jaramillo that was around here. Rings a bell. Albuquerque. Well, he okay. played piano, but he was mostly a jazz player. And okay. he played with a lot of bands around town, you know, Saul Chavez and all those kind of things. But Ben and I used to play a lot of gigs together with Prince Bobby Jack, who was a, was a, a, um, a African-American singer around here, kind of a blues kind of a guy. And, uh, but Ben, I went, ran into Ben in the music store and I said, geez, I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? He says, I'm in the army. I went, oh, you too, God, I gotta go any day now. They're just getting ready to draft me. I already passed the physical and stuff, you know? And he said, we're playing at the, at the base tonight. I think it was up at, at uh, Kirtland at the officers club. And you could get on the base easy in those days. There was no guards there or anything, you just drove on. And so he said, bring your horn up and audition tonight, man. Maybe you can get in the band. I said, in a military band, what, just Susan marches and stuff like that, you know? And he said, no, 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 no. It's a big band, you know? So I went up there 
And I, low, God, I couldn't believe it. It sounded like Woody Herman's band. It had all these great players on it. It was like roaring, you know. And and so Ben introduced me to uh, the, the who was a major at that time, Mark Azzalina. Um, and uh, I went up on a, a, a set and sat in and sight read some things, played a couple of solos. And Mark went in the office and got to a typewriter and wrote out my orders right then and there. And I enlisted the next day. I enlisted so I could pick my own. Right. And I got right. two, three, three years of what I wanted to do. Instead of two years, they would have sent me to Fort Sill for artillery. I already found out. So that's how I got in. The NORAD band was stationed in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a reasonable proximity to Albuquerque if I wanted to get down here on weekends and stuff. But we played, we were on the road like, God, all the time, you know, playing in military bases all over all over Canada, Alaska, Greenland, all through the United States. It was North American Air Defense is what yeah. NORAD stood for. Yeah. But we were out promoting. We played Carnegie Hall every year. We played the World's Fair. And we did. Oh, man, it was like, you know, we were in, we were in L.A. four times a year recording at Capitol Records. And, and uh, we you know, we'd do a little gig and then we'd be free, you know, and we could run around and go to clubs and stuff like that. So I met so many great musicians and things, you know, and uh, and after, but one thing after high school, I went to uh, Bloomington, Indiana in 59 and 60 for the Stan Kenton first ever, uh, we call them stage band camps in those days. They didn't mm -hmm. really use the jazz. There was no jazz in, in school anywhere except uh, for a guy, um, um, what was his name? Uh, Marshall uh, something or other, up around Providence, Rhode Island. It was trying to do uh, a little bit of jazz with some kids, but you know, anyway, uh, the NORAD band turned my life around, you know, because I had gone to university. I was interested in architecture, you know. Uh, I didn't, there were really, there was no, the program at UNM in those days sucked, really. They, Bill Rhodes, Pat Rhodes' father was the band director up there. And he was, you know, Bill had his own talents and everything, but he, he wouldn't let jazz occur up there, you know. And it was like all like marching band and, and concert band and, and Bill used to get on my case all the time because I was always playing bebop and stuff, you know. <laughs> he used to scold me for it, you know. But the thing about it is that uh, when I got in the NORAD band, uh, I learned so much from all the other guys in there. There was people like Phil Wilson on trombone and, and Paul Fontaine, I was his replacement. Paul Fontaine had been on Woody Herman's band for a lot of years, you know, and a great jazz player. And then, and Paul even he introduced me to my wife of like 59, almost 59 years, you know. But, but the thing about it is that I learned so much. I was playing drums in a combo in the band, and I was playing a trumpet in the big band, and and um, I I just studied, and I sat at the piano and learned to play chord changes and so forth. So when we were playing the the New York World Fair in '64, uh, uh, the, the Mark Angelina, who was the colonel by that time, he told me that Sam Donahue on the Tommy Dorsey band was in town and they had, were looking for a trumpet player and they called him and he said to go over there, put on a suit and go over there to the Americana Hotel and audition. I went, who, me? Audition for a, a Tommy Dorsey band? He said, well, I, yeah, go ahead, take a shot at it. You know, you don't know. And, and so I went over there and I walked backstage and the first guy I meet is the great Charlie Shavers, you know, and I went, Oh my goodness. Ah, you know, and so I, I was, and Sam knew me from one of the Kenton clinics. And so I listened to the sets and it was, you know, Frank Sinatra Jr. with the Pied Pipers and, and Charlie and Helen Forrest and all of these great historic people. Mm -hmm. So I, I sat in and I sight read and I could read really well. So uh, I played a couple of solos and, and Sam said, you got it. And I said, well, I'm in the, in the service. He said, well, talk to Mark, you know, and so the next day when we got on the plane to fly back to Springs, uh, Mark said, well, what happened last night? And I said, well, Sam offered me the gig. I told him I was still in the service. And Mark said, take the gig. I'll get you out. And he got me uh, two days later. I flew to Vegas. He he actually routed me out of the service three months early. Uh, he just made a phone call and they got me out. I went down and saluted, took my <laughs> uniforms off, threw it in the garbage and flew to Vegas, you know. And, well, now that answers my that answers my question of of why you left, 
and where you went to, which is, that's, you know, like I said, you have such a history and how <clears throat> and where and what you did that, you know, it's, it's awesome to hear some of this stuff. Now I have a question for you. So, so I know, and I have studied some of your techniques about wedge breathing. And, and there's a rumor out there that, that you learned that method from Maynard Ferguson. Is, is that true or was it the other way around? It's partially true. Maynard, I was on Maynard's van a couple of times in the 60s, you know. And, uh, you know, when you're on the van, you don't go up to Maynard and say, hey, boss, give me a lesson. You know, I mean, <laughs> come on. And Maynard, if you, I, one of the things I'll tell you, you know, I, I, Maynard was one of my most unique personages in my whole life. I, I'm glad I didn't try to take a lesson with him. He could not teach anybody a lesson. Because he would just go, and that, uh, well, um, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you just kind of like do it, you know. And that would be the lesson with Maynard, you know. It was, But what happened is we were, um, in 1974, we were doing a, a, the Belvedere Jazz Festival tour across Canada. And I was playing with Louis Belson's band, and Maynard's band was there also, along with Buddy Rich's band, Woody Herman's band, and the Basie band. There were five big bands involved in this thing for about 10 days. And so we were in Vancouver, and backstage, just getting ready to go on, and Maynard's warming up in front of me, like going, you know, up to double C's and all those shaky kind of trill things that he did. And I had heard an awful lot about Maynard's study and we all used to sit around and say i wonder how in the hell he does that you know but somebody said oh yeah he studied with some guy in india you know some in he's got some yoga kind of thing going so i knew a lot more about it than i let on with maynard but we were backstage and i said uh, hey maynard can i ask you a question i said there's all kind of rumors that you went to some you went to india and some guru showed you this magical way of breathing and that's how you can play double c and you know what? There's something to be said about being in the right place at the right time because Maynard reached in his trumpet case and handed me a little book called The Science of Breath written by a guy by the name of Yogi Ramacharaka. Now, that's a phony name because the guy was, had another name. He's from Chicago. He's a, he's a Caucasian guy from Chicago, but he changed. He wrote this book about yoga breathing. And so Maynard gave me the book. And I was going to just write it down and buy it. He said, no, I got a lot of copies at home, you know? And so he gave me the book and then I read it two times. It didn't make any sense to me because I thought, where's the double C chapter, you know? Right. But what happened is I, I was doing a, a rock and roll horn sweetening session in Hollywood a couple of weeks later and the other trumpet player on it was Bud Brisboy. And I'm sure you remember who Bud Brisboy was. He was a, a brilliant high note specialist, you know, played lead for Kenton's band. I actually met Bud in Albuquerque up at Johnson Gym in 1959 when he was playing with Stan Kenton's band. And, uh, but he toured with Henry Mancini and all that. But Bud saw the book and I, I, I said, you know, I don't get this thing. He says, oh, I can show you. It's the same thing I do. So we stood out in the hallway while they were putting string parts under this rock record. And Bud showed me how to, to use this breath. And I started using it, and I, the thing that I saw right off the bat, I said, God, that, that's completely opposite of what all your teachers seem to say. He says, you can't listen to those teachers all the time. You know? He says, you got to be very careful. And so I started practicing the yoga breath, and within two weeks, less than two weeks, I was playing big, fat double Cs, you know. And I thought, good God, how does this work? So I started teaching it. And that was 1974. And... Now I've got like, you know, I mean, if, if sometime, if you ever get a chance, you're gonna have to come out here and sit. Here's, here's for instance, like a, a drawing that I did just to show you that, that you have to, I'm sorry, there's some stupid thing keeps jumping on my screen. <laughs> you have to support from the umbilical area down here, and then you have to develop these two corner muscles properly. And that's the meat and potatoes of playing the trumpet. Now, a lot of guys don't play from down here because they're told, you have to be relaxed. You have to be relaxed. Well, try to hit a home run relaxed, you know. <laughs> it doesn't work. You got to swing the bat, you know. Yeah. The idea is if a person doesn't play from here, they play strictly from their face. And this is where you get a lot of problems. And the field of pedagogy 
it's got so much false data in it. It's just loaded with opinions that have nothing to do with science of the human body or the science of fluid dynamics, physics, or acoustics, or anything like that. And, and so, you know, it's it, it's. A, I'm not really here to shoot teachers. They do the best they can sometimes, but they're given false information when they go to school. You know, and it's like, right. It's a, what they call a, the contagion of aberration, where it goes like you know. Bill, Bill Cosby used to talk about like father, like son. He said, yeah, but what if, what if your father's an asshole, you know? Yeah, no. I, and, 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 you know, as a, as an instructor myself, I try to teach what, you know, I try to, I, I try not to teach normal techniques because things change. And, and I know what I've had to do to adjust me you know, as a trumpet player because of my asthma. I know what works for me, which Thank you again for the segue because I appreciate that. I own, I still own my 6310Z horn that you had picked up for me back in the 90s. I love it. And and most people, I maybe, maybe it's a misnomer. I don't know whether people realize that you built that horn because of your emphysema. And so, so, or at least partially, can you give me an idea, the design idea behind the 6310Z horn? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I I was in Japan in 1974, uh, uh, I guess. Yeah, 74. The Toshiko Akiyoshi is a big band. Mm -hmm. the guys from the Yamaha. They had a sound check in the afternoon. Two guys from Yamaha uh, came to me after we stopped the sound check and asked me if I would be willing to try some horns for them. And just testing. They weren't making pro horns yet. They were just doing a couple of student models. So I had some time. I went down to the atelier in the Deans in Tokyo, and and uh, I started testing horns. Well, they didn't have any good anything that played well. I was playing an old large war horn in those days, and uh, and it was a good horn, and it's right still sitting right there, <laughs> the very horn that I played for years, and uh, and it's for sale, as a matter of fact. But the point about it is that um, the the Z trumpet came from it's it's historical uh, lineage. It started with a there was a Bob McCoy. Did you ever know who Bob McCoy was in New York City? He was in I the, know the name. Yeah, well, he was in the Tonight Show band when Doc Severinsen and, and and Jimmy Maxwell and those guys were in that band. But Bob McCoy had loaned the Yamaha one of his Martin committee models because they were copying box and Selmers and everything. You know, that's what the Japanese companies do is they copy other horns and then they try to match them up. So they had copied a Martin committee model. When the Martin committee models came out in like 46, I think it was the first ones, they, everybody was excited about them, but they, they fell out of favor real quick because they were, it was called a committee model because there were seven different people that helped design that. Oh, okay. And, and they, and they, that was Frank Olds and and Frank Holton and different people like that. And they could never, it, it was like, you know, I mean, wait a minute, there's four different theories here of people trying to get together. They couldn't, they couldn't get together. Well, the horn, the original Martins were not very good. There were some of them that were better than others, but they fell out of favor real quick. So the Z for, was from that, they had copied one. And when I first played the first one, it was called a 636. And we fumbled around with it, you know, for a while. And I and myself and the guy by the name of Kenzo Kawasaki, who was the big R and D guy with Yamaha. And and Kenzo had been trained an awful lot by Shilke in Chicago. Okay. And so we started trying to do things, changing braces, changing tuning slides, changing water keys. We did everything to change the resonant factors in the horn. We thinned the bell, we changed the bell bead, all these various things, you know, and Try, and we kept improving the horn, and finally, it it got to a point they changed the ser the numbering system to a sixty three, so they called it a sixty three ten, and then they we made an A and a B, different bells and so forth, and then it was getting like so chaotic and confusing that you know I couldn't hardly keep up with with what we were doing, but finally, we got the horn and it felt just fantastic you know and i had been smoking ever since i was 10 years old and i was i was getting 
respiratory problems. I was coughing up blood and stuff. I didn't have emphysema yet, but I was getting the beginnings of it. And I went in and uh, to a doctor and uh, they x-rayed me and said, it, you, you're going to get emphysema if you don't watch it. So I stopped smoking right then and there. And that, I've never, I can't even go into a restaurant where they do hibachi. Oh. Or, you know, any kind of smoke just drives me crazy. But the thing about it is uh, uh, we, we were doing some photo shoots on the new 6310 trumpet. And one of the, uh, the uh, district managers by the name of Johnny Woody, he was there when he kept, I'd play a little while and the guy would shoot pictures of me and, and then Johnny would say, God, that horn's got a sizzle to it when you play, you know? It's just like sizzles out front. It's unbelievable. I've never heard it. Our horn sounds like that. And then I'd go back and do some more and take some more pictures and then he'd say, that sound, I can't get over the sound of that horn. It just zings, you know? I said, ah. It's all like it's Z's. I said, you ought to call it the Z horn. And he said, that's not a bad idea. That's where it came from. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's such a it's such a beautiful horn. I I mean, I absolutely I still remember when I called you and you were in California and I said, I need a new trumpet. And, and you know, we talked about my asthma and you said, no, you should try this horn. And I remember you picked up that one for me. And then you also sent me the flugelhorn, the 635T. And I still have that one too. It's they're both just wonderful horns. They play beautiful. I've got good range on them. They sound oh, I I I can tell you that. And what's funny is is how often you hear people who play them, because all the people I've most out of the five interviews I've done, four of the guys play on either the 6310Z or the 8310Z. So, you know, the last one I went on conversation I had with with Paul and the conversation I had with Ryan, they both play on 6310 Z horns. They're wonderful. Thank you so much for for doing for coming up with that horn. <laughs> well, you so, know, the, the 6310 the, the 6310 Z got replaced by the 8310 Z. They upgraded it, the numbering system, but it's essentially the same horn, but there were some little mic mod modifications, you know. We changed some braces and things. And then somewhere in there, about uh, in the late 80s, they hired Bob Malone, who is a genius of, uh, with tech things about horns. He was a good kind of classically trained trumpet player himself, but he's he knows things about acoustical science and physics and things like that that would baffle you you know but i've i mean i've gotten uh about five more doctorate degrees from just hanging around him and working with him you know but see i'm the guy that yamaha trusted to design horns for them of all of the trumpet players in the world they came to me and said would you help us design a professional model trumpet you know i was like staggered you know i said duh you know well, so so you you've lived everywhere. I mean, you've lived in Vegas, as you said before, you've lived in New York, you worked in the, uh, you know, in the LA area, but now you're back here. How long are you, how long ago did you move home? And, and why did you move home? Well, I moved here in August of 2006. Uh, the reason I moved here is because in 82, I got tired of playing Mork and Mindy and Love Boat and, you know, selling Burger King things and stuff. LA studio work and I had you know like I did a lot of studio work a lot of motion picture soundtracks and a lot of rock and roll records with you know everybody from Neil Diamond to Neil Sedaka to you know movies with Barbra Streisand and but I just got tired of it you know there's not a chance for so very much creativity and I was playing as much jazz as I could with big bands you know Louis Belson's band, Terry Gibbs' big band, and Toshiko's, those were the main three. I played with Bob Florence and Bill Holm and a bunch of others, but, you know, I was concentrating on three big bands, and plus I had a small group of my own, and we, we got a Grammy-nominated album and stuff like that, but what happened is, once I stopped doing studio work, I was concentrating more and more on going out and doing clinics and guest solos with schools all over the the world and things and radio bands and over through Europe and whatever. And I was having so much fun, you know, compared to sitting there doing Mark and Mindy, you know, I thought, you know, this is it, man. And so I made a decision to, to bail on the studios. I retired 
then there was no reason to live in L.A., but I did for a number of years. We survived the earthquake out there. Our house got torn in hell, you know, but we got it repaired. And then, uh, you know, there's no sense in living in L.A. with all of the, you know, the traffic and the cost of living and the noise, you know. And, and <clears throat> my wife's from Boston, and she had been down here. When I would go down to, to Australia, New Zealand, or Asia, or someplace, or Europe for these long trips of like three months at a time, she would come here. My mom was alive, and they got along like frick and frack, you know. So my wife got comfortable with the New Mexico climate and the environment around here. And so we thought about where to move, and we didn't want to move to East Coast or anywhere in the Midwest or in the South or, or you know, we considered Washington and Oregon, but it's too much pollen and there's too much rain up there, and and Arizona's too red and Colorado's too cold and Texas is too Texas. And, so, <laughs> and, and my my wife loves it out here, you know. I mean, it's really very unique and so we moved here uh, we actually settled into the house in uh, august of 2006 we've been here over 15 years you know yeah. and uh, and it's you know it's not you know i miss a lot of the things i miss a lot of the the great hangs the jazz clubs and all of that stuff you know but you know there's uh, so many benefits to living in albuquerque i would never go back and live in a big city again ever 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 never i'd used to love living in new york back in the 60s because there was everything that was happening. I would could go down and hear Miles or Kenny Dorham and, and all of these great people. But I did that already, you know? And uh, I lived in Vegas for a while, but I got sick and tired of, you know, I mean, I did the Vegas shows and all that stuff. But you know, how many Foley Berger shows can you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, great. And then I went to L.A. and I loved L.A. because I could sit next to some of the greatest musicians in the world. And I made a good living out there, you know, and I learned an awful lot by sitting in there, you know, playing with Bud Shank and Art Pepper and, and you know, some of the best people, Horace Silver's band, you know, and all this stuff. Man, I got opportunities to play that I can't believe that I have to still pitch <laughs> And see if it really happens, you know. But. Oh, I, I, and you're not joking. I looked at your discography online and I found a, a web page that had everything that you'd been involved with. And that list was just on and on and on. I kept scrolling down and going, oh my God. Because I know a lot of your albums. I, I remember my first album I bought that was your uh, play song. That was the first album that I ever bought. And, and, and I remember having to beg to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember having to share it with my brother. And then, and I remember in college, you came out with Breakfast Wine. And I, oh, Bre I, Breakfast Wine is my favorite song. I know people tell you that all the time. And I know Nadine is one of my favorites too. The one that you did with the Metropole Orchestra. And, and I mean, I love all of that. And do you have a favorite album, a favorite recording that, that, that brings back memories for you? Is there anything in particular? Well, my favorite album that I've ever done is the one with the Metropole Orchestra, you know, that's it stands as like the most overwhelming, humbling experience in the world. You know, uh, the the guy that did all of the writing, Lex Jasper, and he and I toured uh, Europe a couple of times uh, with uh, one year with Sonny Fortune as the saxophone player and the next year with Pepper Adams on baritone. But Lex Jasper is a brilliant, a Belgian, I mean, a, a Dutch piano player. And he was the chief writer for the Metropole Orchestra. And to, we did that album like in two sessions live, five oh. tunes at a time. And you sit there and, you know, a lot of stuff you do is overdub. But this, I mean, I'm standing right there and he's, Lex is conducting and right in front of him is me standing there in front of my mic. And there's this 80 piece monstrous orchestra right behind me. I'm looking around and going, God, I'm ready to die right now. You know, this is it. You know, so, I, I, I most, and it has sold a lot of, and it's not in print anymore, except it's available as a download on uh, iTunes. But I own the rights to it and uh, have all of the masters and everything. And I've and I've thought about reissuing it, but oh, you should. People are not buying CDs as much as they as they did. Play song just came out, got reissued on CD just only uh, some months ago. You know. Yeah, I I um 
I went through, I, I took There's the, I took my, problem. oh yeah, I took my vinyl and I put it, I made MP3s out of them. So I have them on my computer. I love that album. And, and, and like I said, the Metropole Orchestra album to me was just, I, I have no words for it. You could, you listen to it and it's, I think you said on the liner notes that, that you're such a romantic at heart when you were making this album that, you know, you were overjoyed to make it. It's, it's such a, such a great release, such a, such an amazing release. So, so do you have anything coming up? Any, any, are you working? I mean, I know you're working with your horns and stuff. Do you have any recordings working on any upcoming gigs? I, I looked on your calendar and I didn't see anything. And I thought, I know you teach full time, but nothing, nothing upcoming at all. Well, uh, there was a singer who used to be here, Tommy Gearhart. Do you remember him? Doesn't ring a bell. He was a really good singer. Well, he lived in Albuquerque for a number of years. And when I moved back here, I did a recording with him. And he moved to up to Rochester or someplace like that. And he's now lives in Phoenix. And he's coming here, and we're doing a concert at the Lobo Theater on February the 12th. Oh! Uh, with, uh, uh, with Tommy and Terry Burns on bass. John Funkhauser, who's a new piano player, moved here from from the Boston area, and he's a, a very nice player. And Chase Ellison, who grew up here, is from Albuquerque. And Ch Chase used to take lessons from me, a drum lessons from me when he was a, a kid going to UNM. So uh, we're going to do this concert, and it's just um, it's a rhythm section, Tommy on vo vo voices, me on horn, and uh, a string section, you know. And that's February 12th at the Lobo Theater. Okay. I promise I'll be there. <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I'm not doing a lot of gigs. No, I mean, Bob Fox put together a really nice little uh, sextet, and we did a concert in Santa Fe, and we did one at the, uh, at the Outpost, I think it was, yeah. And then um, my group, I keep, a, I maintain a sextet. We rehearse here. We're not doing it during Christmas because there's too much going on, but but we rehearse almost every Friday here with a good band, you know, and uh, uh, we've did a concert in Corrales in September. Of course, with the pandemic, the only concerts I've been doing are virtual. I've been, I did with some university bands and they record all the charts. And then, you know, Andres Martinez comes over here with his, with his audio thing, sets up a little table and, and Mickey Patton comes over with camera and they film me playing my parts and then they, dub it in and that's and then they send me a check you know okay. so i've been doing some concerts like that on virtual things and sending them around to festivals and stuff but you know i'm not i'm not uh i'm not traveling anymore it's done you know I'm okay not, i don't i don't even want to drive to santa fe for a gig you know <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the point about it is i you know i i did 61 years on the road mike and um I've, I don't want to play lead on any big bands anymore. Uh, that I did that, you know. All I want to do is play creative music, you know, and uh, and I love teaching. I love being able to help people play better, you know. And I'm getting a lot of a lot of people with uh, even classical players. I've been teaching a lot of classical. John Hagstrom from the Chicago Symphony studied with me when he was 19 years old, you know. And I can't tell him how to play the Haydn Trumma Concerto, but I can sure teach him how to warm up and how to breathe and how to control their the acoustical properties you know i mean i study a lot of medicine i have a doctorate degree but it's not in medicine it's useless it's in music it has no value whatsoever <laughs> you know? that's, that's okay so so let's wrap this up i want to thank bobby shu for for talking with me for being who he is and and for doing everything that you've done for the trumpet community and for the things you have done here for albuquerque and for the new mexico area Thank you, Bobby, very much for joining me. I appreciate that. And I look forward to talking with you again in the very, very near future.